Good afternoon. I good afternoon and good morning to my colleagues uh, at the University College London. I hope you can uh, hear me. So we'll. So welcome to uh, the uh, the National Combined Grand Rounds on COVID-19 that the All Institute of Medical Sciences New Delhi has been organizing for now many months in collaboration with Niti Aayog. And uh, indeed, it's a pleasure uh, this time to host it as an international national grand round with our colleagues from the University College London. And I'm delighted to have them uh, here with us. I'm especially delighted to see Professor Monica Lakhanpal, Professor of Integrated Child Health and Pro Vice Provost South Asia, UCL London. Uh, I'm uh, great to see you. And because of Dr. Monica Lakhanpal and Amit Khandalwal, for the last few years, we've been able to really build a lot of partnerships as far as AIMS and UCL is concerned, both in many areas of collaboration and in many projects. I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome Professor Mervyn Singer, Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at UCL London, Professor David Braley, Consultant in Intensive Care Medicine at UCLH and Honorary Associate Professor at UCL London. My colleagues on my left is Professor Navit Vig, Head of the Department of Medicine at the All Institute of Medical Sciences. On my right is Professor Anant Mohan, Head of Pulmonary Medicine, Sleep Disorders and Critical Care at the All Institute of Medical Sciences. And I also have Dr. Pavan Tiwari, Assistant Professor, Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Sleep Disorders and Critical Care, and Dr. Neeraj Nishal, Associate Professor, uh, Department of Medicine. So it's indeed a pleasure to be hosting this uh, international uh, combined grand round. On COVID-19, we are seeing uh, si still a significant number of cases of COVID-19, both in India and in the UK. Uh, concern is a lot uh, as far as UK is concerned because we've just gone through our festive season, uh, the Pavli and other festives, and we've seen the subsequent surge of cases that happened because of that and where people were get gathering in crowds and not having COVID-appropriate behavior. I can understand that UK is sort of gearing up for that with Christmas around the corner. So it is a challenging time for all of us, and COVID-19 has thrown a new, lot of new challenges. One of the challenges is managing these patients because this is a new virus, and we were not really sure how to really go around managing it, what drugs to give. In the early stage, we were not sure whether steroids had a role. We started off by giving drugs for, which was used for HIV, lopinavir, retinavir, and then there was a lot of debate and issues regarding hydroxychloroquine. So we've learned a lot over the last 10, 12, 10 months or so, and we are looking forward to really sharing our experiences of what we've done and how we are managing cases of moderate COVID at the All Institute of Medical Sciences and how things are being managed in a similar manner as far as UCL London is concerned. And then we'll have a little bit of presentation as a topic discussion, and then we will have questions which will be through WhatsApp. Uh, I'll just uh, give the WhatsApp number so that people who are keen can just send us a question through WhatsApp. The number is 9999692364. And before we start the case presentation, I'd like uh, Professor Monica Lakhanpal to give say a few words uh, as part of this combined grand round that we're having between AIMS and UCL. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> It is indeed a great honor to be here with you all. On behalf of myself, as a pediatrician who's also seeing children actually having suffered from COVID and, and going through the recovery phase as well, and as co vice provost for UCL, I welcome you all from India, UK, and around the world. I'm delighted that Professor Galeria and Kumar invited us to join the Energy UCR series, which I know has been highly successful. It is indeed a wonderful opportunity for myself and colleagues at UCL to share our experiences across both countries about COVID-19 and continue this bi-directional dialogue between our two institutions. 
From UCL, I would like to thank Professor Singer and Brearley, who have been at the forefront of dealing with the pandemic in the UK, and Professor Walker, who has supported us with this initiative today. Very proud to say our partnership, as Professor Galeria said, started two years ago. And it started with many discussions, a great number of cups of tea, lots of challenges for us to overcome, but together we have actually made our way through this journey and we're here today. It was a great, as I said, great honour and, and just a wonderful experience to see us all joining despite COVID, despite the difficulties of not being able to travel, to be able to come together and to share our experiences. And I think our partnership will go strength to, from strength to strength. We have trust, we have good relationships, um, and this is demonstrated by this event today. We look forward to more collaborative activity in relation to COVID, but also to other joint ventures initiated from the seed funds that both institutions have committed to, and also in areas of education, which has been demonstrated by activities that we hope to continue, such as those activities with our Institute of Healthcare Engineering. Of course, 90 minutes is never long enough to do justice to such a complex issue and a complex topic that is really a global pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lakunpal. And like you rightly said, we look forward to continuing our collaboration uh, bet between AIMS and UCL, both in terms of the seed money that we have in collaborative research projects, but also in many other areas, whether it be academics or student exchange programs or other activities that we can do. So I look forward to this ongoing dialogue, which may have slowed down a little bit because of COVID-19, but I'm sure uh, that uh, the next year will show a, a, a big thrust as far as this collaboration is concerned. So again, uh, without wasting much time, let me go back to our basic, uh, uh, the grand round that we're having. And the first case will be presented from our side. And this would be a case of moderate COVID that we've seen. And this will be presented by Dr. Pavan Tiwari, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Sleep Disorders and Critical Care. And after that, we'll have the second case from UCL. So over to you, uh, Bhavan. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, now I'll be presenting a case of moderate COVID that we had uh, successfully managed at our center. Uh, this uh, patient is a 62-year-old 62 gentleman who presented with complaints of uh, moderate-grade intermittent fever for uh, seven days dry cough for seven days and along with that he had uh, progressive breathlessness for the last two days before presentation uh, he had history of uh, covid 19 being diagnosed in her in his daughter around 10 days back uh, in past history he was significant for uh, diabetes mellitus type 2 since last 15 years he was on oral hypoglycemic agents and had reasonably well controlled blood sugars which uh, with a recent hba1c of 7.3 he also was a case of known case of systemic hypertension and he was on um, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers that is tell me certain uh, 40 milligram once a day and it, he had well controlled blood pressures and there was no history of any end organ damage. Uh, when he presented to us, he was hemodynamically stable. That is, his blood pressure was 130 by 74 millimeter of mercury. He had tachycardia, heart rate was 116 per minute. His respiratory rate was 26 per minute, so he had tachypnea, but he had no use of accessory muscles. His saturation on room air was 92%. Um, he was immediately initiated on oxygen supplementation and uh, via nas nasal prongs and with uh, a supplementation at the rate of 2 liters per minute, he was maintaining an acceptable saturation of around 95%. His uh, x-ray actually showed uh, bilateral peripheral infiltrates, uh, x-ray which we have now we are now com commonly seeing and we think of as suggestive of COVID pneumonia. Uh, again, so uh, in this case scenario, as he had a chest X-ray, which was suggestive of COVID, um, we uh, 
we did a rapid antigen test as per our protocol which was negative but then as rapid antigen test was negative but patient uh, was clinical radiologically suggestive of covid uh, we did a true not that is a, a, a rapid cb not based test which was done in ams casualty and it came positive for sars cov2 and patient was subsequently admitted in covid hdu at nci at this time his random blood venous glucose was 310 mg per deciliter and also his abg was suggestive of respiratory alkalosis with hypoxemia so uh, our initial diagnosis was diabetes mellitus type 2 with systemic hypertension and moderate covid pneumonia in view of uh, saturation of less than 94% and uh, a respiratory rate of more than 24 per minute at baseline so with this diagnosis we immediately started the patient on remdesivir 200 mg stat followed by 100 mg once a day uh, doxycycline was started initially at 100 mg twice a day uh, we started on low dose dexamethasone 6 mg once a day and uh, along with dvt prophylaxis and we instituted awake proning for this patient um this was the initial laboratory investigations that we got so his tlc was within normal range he had lymphopenia with a lymphocyte count of around 480 um uh, rest of the investigations were normal except for a serum uh, crp which was elevated at 20 mg per deciliter uh subsequently uh, patient uh, improved with treatment his fever uh, resolved in next 48 hours his saturation improved to 93% on room air by day 3 though he was desaturating on minimal exertion we uh, deescalated his antibiotics by day 3 blood sugars were controlled using uh, insulin regimen basal bolus regimen we continued tell me certain as he had good uh, well controlled blood pressures on this drug subsequently he continued to improve clinically over the next week and he uh, came off oxygen on day 6 and was maintaining saturation of 95 96% on room air without significant desaturation uh, remdesivir was stopped after completing the 5 day regimen which we uh, follow as per our institutional protocol uh, dyspnea improved by day 8 and he could walk to washroom and do activities of daily living without support by this time we stopped steroids on day 10 and subsequently uh, patient was discharged home on day 11 so our final diagnosis in this case was diabetes mellitus type 2 systemic hypertension and uh, moderate covid pneumonia so the take home message that we want to convey with this case is that uh, along with age diabetes and hypertension are uh, risk factors for moderate and severe covid 19 and in symptomatic patients who have a negative rapid antigen test they should uh, that should always be confirmed using uh, definitive tests like rt pcr or cb nat or true nat in this case uh the cb nat uh, provides rapid diagnosis in emergency settings uh angiotensin receptor blockers uh, and ace inhibitors can be successfully uh, safely continued in uh, patients with covid-19 and uh, the uh, the standard of care for these patients remains low dose steroids remdesivir and dvt prophylaxis awake proning uh, as per our experience and as per literature we have found to be very useful in these patients and most of the cases of moderate covid have a favorable outcome thank you thank you pavan uh, before we go on to having a discussion on these cases or a presentation of the topic i'm going to invite professor david brearley from the university college london to present a case of a very large covid thank you very much professor good afternoon uh, again from a somewhat cold damp london uh, we're delighted to take part in this so uh, without much further ado let's carry on so we're going to call our case one of very large covid and i think you'll find out why in a moment anyway the the, um, the case involves a 41 year old uh, chap who uh, looks after and runs a local pub or a local bar now that makes him very important uh, to the local community because this is where large swathes the hospital staff will go every friday evening to spend their money He describes himself as being fit and well. Now I don't know what it's like in India, but um, in the UK, most people who look after pubs and bars uh, tend not to embrace the healthy lifestyle. And indeed, this guy weighs in at something over 200 kilograms. He says he smokes a little and he drinks a little bit of alcohol. But if you've ever had the misfortune to meet a Londoner, let alone uh, treat one, that what that really means is he smokes a lot and he drinks far more. than he should do but to be fair he doesn't have any official uh medical diagnoses 
Now, his story essentially starts in March when the uh, COVID, first COVID wave is just starting to hit the UK shores. We're just starting to grapple with it. Not quite sure what's going on. But he presents very similar to your case with a week's worth of flu-like symptoms, myalgia, arthralgia, fevers, uh, cough, etc., which gradually comes worse and it's associated with an increase and difficulty of breathing and ongoing fever. And one evening, the breathing becomes so difficult, he calls an ambulance and the ambulance arrives. And they found that he's struggling to breathe in his pub and his oxygen saturations are around 50% on air. Well, they give him some oxygen and thankfully those saturations come up uh, reasonably quickly into the low 90s. So they take him off uh, to see us in the emergency department at University College Hospital. There he uh, remains heavily dependent on that oxygen and because of his size, et cetera, et cetera, and everyone's very worried about him, they not unreasonably refer him up to us on the intensive care unit. And when he arrives to see us, he's uh, got a pretty high respiratory drive, 35 breaths a minute or there or so. Uh, he needs a lot of oxygen, but if you actually talk to him, he says, uh, you know what, Doc, I'm feeling fine. I was certainly feeling a lot better than I did, so thank you. Um, he's got an x-ray that uh, back in March was quite novel, but unfortunately, I think for all of us uh, on this call, uh, it's uh, pretty standard fare these days. Um, like you guys, we sent off some blood tests that showed some degree of inflammation. But back in March, we were, we were less organized in the, this area. And today, I think very similar to you, we would now send a panel of lactate dehydrogenases, ferritins, D-dimers, BNPs, IL-6s, et cetera, et cetera, to essentially gear up the amount of inflammation and try and predict his outcome and certainly his need for, for intubation. So with this high oxygen requirement, we very quickly started on CPAP and that seemed to work. His gas exchange definitely improved, his work of breathing decreased, and he said he felt even better. Obviously, it's very difficult to continue CPAP uh, indefinitely, so we gave him breaks on high flow nasal oxygen that allowed him to eat, to drink, uh, to wash himself, etc., etc. But he remained essentially CPAP dependent for days with high respiratory drive and reasonably high oxygen requirements. Now, if you met this guy, he was absolutely delightful. He was very polite and incredi incredibly compliant despite all the things that we were putting him through. And despite this, the CPAP mask was beginning to cause problems uh, around the bridge of his nose. His skin was beginning to break down and the other masks would fit because of his size. We couldn't use a CPAP hood because his neck was too large, et cetera, et cetera. And with this high respiratory rate, we were getting a little bit worried. Are we inflicting self-induced lung injury on this chap? Should we intubate him? Should we ventilate him? Are we sure we're doing the right thing here? And we weren't. So every day and often several times a day, uh, a number of us as the intensive care consultants would stand outside his room and we would discuss uh, what we should do. Should we just go in and intubate him or not? And we all thought this is going only one way. So the family with all the equipment ready and we went in and he said oh I'm really hungry he said oh well, I'm so sorry I think we're going to intubate you later today um so so, so uh you know nil by mouth from, from from here on in but every time we walked into that room he was calm he was collected he was polite he said thank you he gave us a thumbs up said he felt no problems at all and of course, we were now beginning to see what was happening to our intubated patients. They didn't exactly get better quickly. They were on the ventilator for weeks. Uh, cardiovascular collapse, about half of them needed renal replacement therapy. And with this size, we knew that this was going to become increasingly difficult. We probably weren't going to be able to prone him. Weaning would be difficult, access hard, and so on and so forth. So each time we went to see him, Despite the numbers, we would shake our heads, we would walk away and say, no, let's carry on for a bit longer and see where this takes us. And that's what we did. And this is an excerpt from his uh, electronic medical record, which of course is no doubt very hard to see. But what it shows is um, over the period of four to five days, he's uh, essentially a, continuously on, on CPAP, but things gradually get better and we wean him off onto high flow nasal oxygen. You can see this blue line here of his oxygen requirement is FiO2 gradually decreasing over that period of time 
and his high respiratory drive that continues about the same amount of the oxygen gradually decreases after day three, day four. So ultimately, he gradually improves. And by day eight, we're able to discharge him to the ward. Very similar story to your story by the sounds of it. And home by day 11. On the positive side of uh, this story is that over that sort of 11 days, he seems to have managed to lose 20 kilograms. That is, that's fantastic. But um, as I was sort of going through the notes, trying to prepare this little talk, I came across uh, uh, an interesting letter that is sent automatically by our electronic health record from the dietitian, And this is a warning to us all about automating healthcare. Again, my guess is it's very hard to read on small screens and so on and so forth. But what it says is, um, following your recent hospital admission for COVID-19, we would like to offer you some dietary advice. It goes on to say that uh, people who have suffered COVID-19 often have problems with their eating and their drinking. And essentially, the dietitian is encouraging him to get back to doing just that. Unfortunately, our chap listens to this advice. And by the time we see him again in outpatients in July, he's well over 200 kilos again. But at least his chest X-ray is now clear. Uh, he's feeling in pretty good health, not quite back to normal, but almost. He gets a bit breathless on exertion. Um, we make him do a whole load of sit to stand tests, uh, which to be fair, he can do about 18 repetitions, which is not bad at all. But he does desaturate a little bit on, on doing that. So really just to conclude this talk, um, actually this story did work out. Uh, it worked out very well and everyone was delighted. But at the time, in the middle of all of that, we were really worried. We were particularly worried that we were, were doing harm going on and on uh, with CPAP. And it wasn't clear at the time. Hospitals around us were, were saying, no, 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 you must intubate these people as soon as they arrive, etc." And our experience was limited. And uh, as I say, the national advice and local advice was uh, we were getting it wrong. But, you know, intubating a chap like this and high FiO2 sort of been challenging and weaning him from the ventilator would be very hard indeed. And he seemed so much better, uh, as they often all do, uh, than his numbers ever suggested. So in the end, this case worked out well and it really helped cement our belief in CPAP and that this strategy was, at least in many, a good start. That said, we don't have all the answers to all the questions. And even today, we stand in front of these patients and uh, talk amongst ourselves, well, you know, okay, he's on okay on CPAP, but when should we intubate? How long should we carry on with the CPAP? Two days, four days, a week, two weeks? Patients now are almost demanding to go on CPAP and refusing to be intubated. It, it's, uh, it's almost the reverse of where we were in March. Is CPAP truly harmful? Is it more harmful than ventilation? Does self-induced lung injury exist at all? And certainly does it exist with COVID? And we do know that, you know, certainly uh, in our series and across Italy and China, that 50% of our patients will fail their CPAP. Well, can we identify them reliably up front such that we, can, uh, we could potentially intubate and ventilate them earlier or at least intervene in different ways? These are all questions that we are throwing around uh, today and to which we have uh, no great answer, but are very happy to chat that one through with you. I'm going to leave it at that. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, so, Professor, I will hand back to you and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. David Brealy, for an excellent case and bringing out the point which I think we've learned over the last few months, that one of the key treatment strategies as far as COVID-19 is concerned, especially in these patients with hypoxemia and those who have what we call happy hypoxemia, is oxygen therapy. And the more you can delay intubation and focus on NIV, non-invasive ventilation, or on high-flow nasal cannula, the better the outcome. And this is something which has changed our overall approach. In the early months, there was a lot of reluctance among healthcare workers, actually, to use these forms of treatment because of that fear of aerosol generation and getting the infection as far as uh, high-flow nasal cannula or NIV was concerned. But gradually over time, we all realized that this was making a big difference and we were losing more patients 
after intubation with VAP and other complications, uh, which uh, was in increasing our mortality. And now there is this whole focus of really using more and more of high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation. Uh, patients have also become aware of it. The whole concept of uh, conscious proning has also come in. And that I think has helped us really bring down the mortality over uh, the few over the months that we've seen COVID-19. This has also been one of the main strategies that we have followed. It is a difficult question about uh, when to intubate. We'll discuss that when we come to our uh, discussion and also how long to continue HFNC or NIV or which patient should be put on NIV, which patient should be put on HFNC, how do you sort of toggle between the two, and of course the whole issue of how long do you continue it. In some of our patients who have the so-called long COVID or lung fibrosis, they've continued to be on NIV and HFNC for weeks or months. We've had two patients who've been on HFNC for now almost two months and they have extensive fibrosis in the lung and are undergoing a very aggressive pulmonary rehabilitation program. So I would, uh, before I open uh, and have the uh, discussion, we will have the topic presentation, but I'll just once again like to remind the audience to send questions through WhatsApp, our number being 9999-692364. It's being also shown at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please send your questions on this uh, WhatsApp number and we'll try and answer them as much as possible. Let's go on to the topic presentation. And the topic presentation from our side, from India, would be Managing Moderate COVID in India. And this will be done by Dr. Neeraj Nishal, who's an Associate Professor of Medicine at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. So over to you, doc Dr. Neeraj. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning in UK. So uh, when this pandemic first hit us, we were not prepared and uh, the management strategy, uh, we were not, uh, basically we were clueless how to manage such patients because this was a new virus uh, with new manifestation, pathophysiology was not known. Even after almost a year into pandemic, the ideal treatment still remained elusive. We have become wiser as the uh, pandemic has progressed, but uh, still a lot is, no, uh, is to be known about this virus. Our quest for that elusive magic antiviral continues and the treatment strategy is largely based on the uh, on good uh, supportive care, uh, immunomodulation and anticoagulation. So I will be discussing uh, uh, this management protocol under following headings. So the classification of disease severity was established very early in the pandemic, uh, but the journey of management of COVID-19 has been a combination of eminence and evidence-based medicine. Because at the start, we don't have enough quality uh, uh, publications which, which could guide our treatment of such patients. So treatment guidelines have evolved as new evidence have been generated. So uh, the COVID severity uh, is classified based on the presentation of the patient. And uh, the patient with mild presentation are the ones who have uncomplicated URTI and no evidence of any hypoxia or breathlessness. Moderate patients are those with uh, evidence of pneumonia uh, without signs of any severe disease and symptoms usually are dyspnea, fever, cough with uh, uh, room air saturation uh, between 90 to 94 and usually respiratory rate is between 24 to 30. Severe pneumonia when we have evidence of pneumonia plus respiratory rate more than 30, severe respiratory distress or room air saturation less than 90. So this classification is important because what we have realized over our time that this moderate severity patients are the one which uh, which which are very important for us. The reason being, for mild patient, there is no evidence uh, uh, based uh, treatment to prevent progression, and most of these patients recover uh, with mainly with supportive care. The severe one again, uh, the effective treatment for severe uh, COVID-19 is very difficult, and patients uh, the fatality rate in such group is very high. And when patient recovers, usually they have long-term sequelae. So the moderate severity patients are the ones in whom we have best evidence for available therapy. And these are the group of patients where if we actively manage this patient at right time with right uh, treatment uh, strategy, then we can salvage them. We can reverse the pathophysiology, salvage them without any sequelae. So uh, whenever a patient presents to us, uh, we take a good history, do a, a vital charting, a general physical examination to look for any uh, 
extra pulmonary manifestation of COVID-19 and assessment of prior comorbidities. So actively we have to seek uh, history of any prior comorbidities uh, with the patient because most of patients, what we have seen that uh, the presence of comorbidity is independent risk factor for mortality. So these uh, comorbidities should be actively sought for. And uh, the various comorbidities uh, which has been associated with bad prognosis include age, uh, any underlying uh, cardiovascular disorder, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and other uh, conditions. So uh, whenever patient presents, uh, we have to get some certain test, uh, baseline tests done, including hemogram, basic metabolic profile, depending on the underlying uh, metabolic uh, abnormality or comorbidities. Baseline inflammatory markers may help us in prognosticating and uh, assessing the severity of disease. ABG is usually uh, taken at uh, baseline so that whatever pH ratio and AC, uh, base imbalance is there, we can correct accordingly. ECG is, ECG is done in uh, all the patients and wherever there is evidence of some uh, underlying cardiac uh, problem, then cardiac biomarkers and ECO may be suggested. Investigation related to diagnosis and management of comorbidities are also uh, done at the baseline. There are various prognostic markers that have been described for as a prognostic markers. But seeing them in isolation may be fraught with danger. So we usually use a combination of these markers along with clinical radiological settings uh, to prognosticate uh, such patients and ensure that we can identify at-risk patients who have chances of progression to severe uh, COVID-19. Uh, a baseline chest X-ray is advised in all the patients and wherever uh, there is doubt between the clinical correlation and uh, chest X-ray findings, uh, we uh, go ahead with uh, chest uh, uh, CT, uh, mainly high resolution contrast uh, tomography. So the typical findings seen on uh, any uh, CT include the GGOs, which is usually early, peripherally located with multifocal and bilateral distribution. Other patterns may have also been described including crazy paving appearance, reverse halo, organizing pneumonia patterns. Whenever atypical uh, features like pleural effusion, lymphadenopathy, cavitation, etc. is present, then we should actively look for any superadded infections as well. Uh, CTPA is usually not performed in all patients, but wherever we have uh, suspicion of underlying pulmonary embolism based on clinical findings and other risk factors, one may advise CTPA as well. The, uh, the CT severity score that has been described uh, variously, then we have to be very, uh, we have to take it in, in the clinical setting for simple reason that all the severity score are based on the visual uh, analog. So once there could be inter-observation variation and we have to be careful while just uh, looking at the CT scores, we cannot uh, predict the severity of the disease. That has to be taken into account the clinical settings as well as the other lung findings, lab findings. So once patient is admitted, we have to closely monitor as pulmonary disease can rapidly progress. So vital charting, uh, SpO2 monitoring uh, for worsening respiratory condition has to be uh, done. We routinely do not prescribe antibiotics unless there is clinical suspicion of bacterial infection. Symptomatic treatment with antipyretics and antitussives are advised. Steroid nebulization may be used to curb local inflammation, especially those patients who have a dry hacking cuff or if there is sign of any uh, bronchospasm, those patients uh, can benefit from uh, steroid nebulization. The fluid management is again a very important aspect in managing such patients because there is insensible loss, especially because of fever or because of the high respiratory effort of these patients. These patients may also have GI loss owing to vomiting and diarrhea, which is again a very common uh, presenting complaint of such patients. The evolution of pharmacological management has been, uh, has been gradual over uh, last one year. And when we started way back in April 2020, then hydroxychloroquine along with azithromycin and uh, antiretroviral drug like uh, lopinavir, ritonavir were considered as the mainstay of treatment. But... Uh, over a period of time, when we become wiser about the pathophysiology of the disease and uh, more evidence emerged, we realized that uh, proper use of anti-inflammatory or immunomodulated therapy along with anticoagulation can save life in such patients. However, the role of antiviral in such group of patients still remain very controversial. So when we started, the oxygen therapy remained the mainstay of treatment and that remains mainstay of treatment as, uh, of now as well. 
So target SpO2 in such patients uh, is be between 92 to 96 uh, percent and between 88 to 92 percent in patients with COPD. Preferable devices for uh, delivering oxygen depends on the patient comfort acceptance along with FiO2 requirement. Risk of aerosol generation was uh, considered uh, prominently in the initial part of the pandemic, but uh, with time we have realized if uh, we are uh, following adequate personal protective uh, equipment strategy and protocols, then chances of getting infected through this is very low. So the risk of aerosol generation is now, is now no longer considered uh, as a part of treatment uh, decision making. So depending on the FiO2 and flow rate, uh, one can select among all these uh, available oxygen delivery devices depending on the requirement of the patients. If the target is not achieved, uh, we have to give a cautious trial of NIV. Patients on NIV require intensive monitoring, so such patients should ideally be monitored in HDU or ICU setting only. Awake proning is an adjunctive therapy and should be given in all patients. Early self proning in awake and non intubated patient is always recommended. Oxygen therapy is continued uh, while patient is, uh, is advised regarding awake proning. So, typical uh, protocol includes uh, uh, positioning in various positions including proning, uh, prone position, uh, lateral positions and upright sitting position in a cycle of 30, to, uh, 30 minutes to 2 hours. Uh, because of the pandemic, we keep on seeing many post-trauma patients presenting with COVID-19. So, we have to be very careful while uh, advising awake proning in all patients and we should be careful and we should be aware of the contraindication for <coughs> awake proning. The pharmacotherapy, like uh, I discussed, depend uh, is mainly based on the uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-coagulation, and antiviral uh, therapy. So the four pillars of um, management of moderate COVID include oxygen therapy, corticosteroids, anti-coagulation, and good supportive care based on the underlying comorbidity. The role of antivirals, anti-IL-6 therapy, monoclonal antibodies remain controversial. So, uh, while talking about anti-inflammatory, when this uh, pandemic started, the WHO interim guidelines in uh, March 2020 said do not routinely give systemic corticosteroids for treatment of viral pneumonia. Uh, based on the experience from previous uh, viral pneumonias like influenza, SARS and MERS. However, with time and better understanding of the pathophysiology and the role of inflammation and, uh, and cytokine storm, we decided that uh, some patients might benefit from steroids and that's why we introduced it in our protocol in May 2020. So, uh, in our patients, whoever required oxygen with or without elevated inflammatory markers or in case inflammatory markers were raised with evidence of disease progression, we prescribed uh, steroids. Uh, initially, we started with IV methylpred in doses of 0.5 to 1 mg per kg or Oral or IV dexamethasone, 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg and duration used to be 3 to 5 days and in some cases where required, it could be prolonged. So this uh, recommendation were further supported by uh, publication of recovery trial which showed benefit of uh, steroids, especially in patients uh, who have invasive mechanical ventilation and oxygen requirement. So we have to be careful that this role of steroid has been demonstrated in those patients uh, along with su uh, usual support care, which require oxygen. If we use steroids in patients who are not on oxygen therapy, this may prove detrimental. So, steroids should ha uh, have a role, but it should not be indiscriminately used in all patients, especially in the initial part of disease. The other uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-IL-6 therapy uh, part, tocilizumab, uh, the use has been extrapolated from other cytokine release syndrome. Initially, it had shown beneficial in uh, certain observational studies uh, by blocking the IL-6 receptors. However, uh, the meta-analysis carried subsequently did not show any uh, short-term mortality benefit. However, some studies did show reduced risk of mechanical ventilation in hospitalized patients uh, with COVID-19 without any increased risk of infection or adverse event. So, uh, should tocilizumab be used? Again, it's a controversial thing. And uh, the use in our country is off-level use. Can be used in select patients with moderate to severe disease who are not improving dis uh, despite steroids. But we have to rule out active infections. Should be considered in patients who are 
deteriorating with uh, markedly raised inflammatory markers. The uh, cutoff for IL-6 has been taken as five times, which is arbitrary. So it has to be uh, used in appropriate cl clinical settings and not in all patients whom, whom IL-6 is raised by more than five times. The usual dose prescribed is 4 to 8 mg per kg with maximum dose of 800 mg and can be repeated if required in uh, in next 24, uh, 12 to 24 hours if uh, the need be. Again, uh, the hallmark of uh, this disease is the uh, widespread uh, microthrombotic complications which was thought initially thought to be the uh, biggest contributor to mortality in initial part of pandemic. So once we realize that pathophysiology, anticoagulation becomes standard uh, treatment part, in, especially in patients requiring uh, oxygen or, uh, or, or mechanically intubated patients. So low molecular weight heparin is preferred in once daily dosing in moderate severity COVID patient in dose of 0.5 mg per kg uh, subcutaneous. Those patients who have renal ins insufficiency, UFH uh, ultra uh, fractionated heparin is considered. D-dimer levels may be helpful in guiding anticoagulation, but all raised D-dimer levels will not uh, pretend uh, chances of getting uh, thrombotic complications. So, especially the mild patients with raised D-dimer should not be indiscriminately given anticoagulations. Before starting uh, anticoagulation, one should estimate bleeding risk with risk scores like has blood score. Uh, but we have to be careful that uh, this, uh, all these bleeding, uh, high bleeding risk group with this risk course have been <coughs> validated for other conditions like anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation patients. So whether that is applicable to our COVID-19 patient is again a matter of debate. Antivirals, one of the most promising uh, uh, treatment modality. However, the that elusive antiviral which can take care of patients of all group, whether it's mild, moderate or severe, still remains elusive. We started with hydroxychloroquine and uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, but with time we realized that they were not that effective. Remdesivir started with a lot of fanfare and was seen as magic bullet, but again has fallen short of our expectations. Convalescent plasma, which, which, which have been used in previous pandemic of uh, 1918 uh, and also in other infectious diseases, uh, again hold a lot of promise. However, the various trials done world over did not show the type of benefit which we were expecting. So remdesivir was thought to be a magic bullet because of its high selectivity index, but when used in clinical practice did not translate into uh, the actual benefit. So uh, this WHO solidarity trial consortium meta-analysis have clearly shown that remdesivir is not a magic bullet and does not have mortality benefit. However, there is a select group of patients in whom uh, there is low flow oxygen requirement. The stay in hospital may be uh, reduced by use of remdesivir. So all is not lost for remdesivir and appropriately designed further trials are required to completely negate the role of remdesivir in management of uh, COVID patients, especially those with low flow oxygen, they may benefit from uh, this particular drug. All patients must have uh, GFR determined and hepatic lab testing done before initiation. The usual dose for non-ventilated patients include uh, loading dose of 200 mg on day 1, followed by 100 mg on day 2 to 5. Those with mechanical ventilation may, uh, the duration may be prolonged for up to 10 days uh, based on the treatment response. The important contraindication include raised uh, liver enzymes by more than five times. If the GFR is less than 30 and patient require hemodialysis, pregnant and lactating women, children less than 12 years. Convalescent plasma, again, that has been widely used in our country. However, the exact mortality benefit uh, which, which which was expected as the we expected this ne neutralizing antibodies act to act against the virus has not uh, uh, materialized in the real life clinical practice so multiple trials done across the world one of the one of the trial done in our country by icmr placid trial did not reveal any benefit mortality benefit in such patients however most of these trials have inherent problems and uh, this include uh, limited data in mild disease Unknown efficacy with early administration because most of these patients received plasma uh, in the later half of their disease. 
the lack of a standardization of antibody titers. Again, that was a very important drawback in all these studies. Uh, this study published in NEGM in November also showed that the effect of conversant plasma did not uh, translate into a survival benefit. So, the role of plasma is debatable, but if we conduct a trial uh, in which the patients are given this uh, plasma in early part of disease with comorbidities, we may have a, a group of patients who may actually benefit from this therapy. So, further well-designed trials need to be done before ruling out plasma as a, a therapeutic option. Various considerations have to be kept while using plasma like ABA compatibility, Plasma IgG level in the donor should be more than 1 is to 640. Monitoring should be uh, is required for reactions. And patients with IgA deficiency or immunoglobulin allergy should not be given uh, plasma therapy. Dose is variable ranging from 4 to 13 milliliter per kg. Usual single dose of 200 milliliter given over at least 2 hours. And a repeat dose can be given after 24 to 48 hours. Potential adverse events should be kept into mind. So patients uh, uh, should be monitored closely in the hospital setting and following parameters should be performed every 48 to 72 hours including CVC, differential count, absolute lymphocyte count, KFT, LFT unless indicated earlier. A follow-up inflammatory markers may be repeated. Chest imaging when and where deemed necessary may be repeated. ABG analysis for monitoring PF ratio should be done especially when the patient's clinical, uh, cl there is clinical worsening of the patient. Uh, control of comorbid condition is very important. Acid waste balance and correction of electrolyte disturbances should be done. Uh, hemoglobin uh, should be maintained over 8 gram uh, per deciliter with, uh, uh, in case of severe anemia and thrombocytopenia. Volume status, especially of patients of CKD and patients with congestive heart failure is very important. The target in hospital sugars uh, should be kept between 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter. If uh, required, we should use insulin dose, especially higher insulin dose in case of, uh, because of the steroid induced insulin resistance in such patients. We have to closely monitor for severe disease and oxygen escalation should be done uh, when work of breathing is very high. Uh, increasing oxygen requirement is there. There is hemodynamic instability. One has to monitor for progressive worsening of PF ratio, hypotension requiring vasopressor support, worsening mental status, multi-organ dysfunction. And once all these uh, signs are there, we should shift these patients to ICU or SDU for any of the above conditions. So when is a patient ready to discharge? So in case of moderate uh, patient, uh, if fever is not there for three days and oxygen saturation is maintained without support for at least three days, then discharge after 10 days of onset symptom uh, can be considered, especially when there is no uh, fever without antipyretics, resolution of breathlessness, and there is no oxygen requirement. If symptoms not resolved and de a demand of oxygen therapy continues, discharge only after resolution of clinical symptoms and ability to maintain oxygen saturation for at least three consecutive days. We usually do not recommend a repeat PCR test uh, before discharge except for in certain conditions like patients with immunodeficiencies. Post-discharge follow-up is again very important. Uh, we advise 7 days home isolation. Continuation of medication for comorbidities is again reinforced. Incentive spirometry and pulmonary rehabilitation is advised. Tapering dose of oral steroid depending on the level of pulmonary fibrosis or prolonged oxygen requirement uh, is, is advised. Steroid-based MDI, especially in presence of pulmonary fibrosis, is, uh, is uh, given. However, we do not advise routine anticoagulation or antifibrotic agents in such patients. We usually ask this patient to follow up in our COVID clinic after two weeks, and we stress upon continuation of COVID-appropriate behavior in such patients. On follow-up, uh, we uh, reassess the patients for any uh, uh, residual complication. If required, chest X-ray, coagulation profile and other lab parameters are repeated. And depending on that, further evaluation if anything abnormal is found is advised. So to summarize, uh, like I said earlier that the moderate severity patients are the one where the maximum benefit has been demonstrated of the available treatment options. So these patients should be identified and adequately managed. 
So supportive care and oxygen therapy is the cornerstone of management of COVID-19. Steroids and anticoagulation have shown a benefit in patients requiring oxygen. Remdesivir and convalescent plasma may still play a role in specific subset of patients. Key to successful therapy rests in the hands of treating physician to determine the appropriate timing of administration of any therapeutic administration in appropriate patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Neeraj Nishchal. And I think you've highlighted the most important point that is appropriate treatment for the appropriate patient at the appropriate time. Because uh, I think one thing that we've learned from COVID-19 treatment is that the timing of when to give which drug is very, very important. Steroids too early may be harmful. They have to be given at a proper point in time. And giving antivirals also too late uh, may not be very useful, including convalescent plasma. So we'll take the questions which have been coming uh, after the second topic presentation, which is from our colleagues from University College London. And I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, invite Professor Mervyn Singer to give his talk on UK management, keep them off the ventilator unless necessary. Again, something very, very important because this helps in decreasing the mortality. Over to you, Professor Singer. Thank you very much and hello to everyone in India from a, a chilly London and, uh, and hopefully you'll get through COVID uh, smoothly and hopefully we will too. And in fact, Dr. Brilli and I both had our vaccinations last night, so hopefully uh, we'll be on the way to protection. Okay, so if we wind back to um, spring 2020, we had this new disease phenotype and we still don't fully understand the pathophysiology. There was no evidence base about which we could base best treatment. There was no proven therapeutic nor adjunct therapy. There were these worries bordering on paranoia about the risk to healthcare workers from this potentially deadly virus. And when the patients came, they came in very large numbers, certainly in Wuhan, in Italy, and certainly in London, they were overwhelming. And unfortunately, the UK was largely underprepared and under-resourced, especially intensive care beds. And uh, you can see on the left-hand slide, the United Kingdom has 6.6 .6 critical care beds per 100,000 inhabitants. But if you look even further down, India is struggling even more. Obviously, you have a much, much bigger population, but you have a third of what we have, and we have a fraction of what's available in Germany and the United States. And what scared the government in the UK was uh, the lack of intensive care beds and ventilators. So the red line on the right-hand graph um, shows even with increasing the number of critical care beds, we could be easily overwhelmed if there was no sort of national measures in terms of lockdown or whatever. And that obviously prompted the lockdown in the middle of March in the UK. And uh, the newspapers uh, obviously uh, jumped on the bandwagon and there were all these horror stories of 8 million Britons being put in hospital, frail people may not get critical care, etc. And the UK normally has about three and a half thousand adult intensive care beds. And by using anaesthetic machines, uh, uh, machines or ventilators were borrowed from the private sector. The capacity rose to about 8,000, but the modeling suggested we would need up to 40,000. However, every man and his dog around the world was trying to buy a ventilator. And um, depending on how rich the country was, uh, there was a lot of gazumping. So the United States was gazumping Europe, who were gazumping uh, less well-off countries. And crucially, there was a lack of trained staff to look after this huge increase in ventilator requirement, even assuming the ventilators were there. So our uh, wonderful prime minister uh, put out this call to British industry to make ventilators from scratch because we have no intrinsic large-scale ventilator manufacturing uh, capacity. So on the 15th of March, he put out this plea for Rolls-Royce and Airbus and Dyson to make ventilators. And certainly uh, in our hospital, we weren't quite sure where he was getting his uh, advice from. We felt this was rather misguided. Um, 
certainly our experience with COVID and what we've been hearing from China, from Italy, was that these patients were very difficult to ventilate. And uh, you can't make sophisticated ventilators to cope with these patients in a matter of weeks, let alone months. And the point I made before, it's not just the machines, you need the trained staff to safely cope with this huge influx of demand. And we've been getting uh, messages from China, from Italy, and I've got lots of friends and colleagues who work in intensive care units in this, these countries, and they're saying you can't cope with just using mechanical ventilation. And this is in one of the British tabloids, Italy in hell, Britain to follow. And you can see patients getting helmet CPAP. And they were in, embraced into guidelines. This is in Italian, but you can see the word CPAP comes up. And this is from the Ligurian region in Northwest Italy. And I contacted lots of Italian intensivists and they found that their healthcare workers weren't all coming down with COVID. They weren't admitting them as patients. They were coping with hospital oxygen supplies and about half the patients were being kept off ventilators. So this spared the resource, the scarce resource for those patients who really, really did need them. So uh, at the time, national guidance in the UK was uh, to intubate early, but basically in our hospital, um, we uh, took on board what was happening in China and Italy. Unfortunately, our government weren't talking to China and Italy, and we started preparing to use CPAP. And there was strong buy-in from the doctors, the nurses, and actually our hospital management. Our chief executive is actually an academic medic and a, a very good one. So we developed algorithms commencing from the emergency department front door, our respiratory physicians, trained doctors and nurses to manage CPAP in non-ICU areas. We set up a new respiratory high dependency unit, trained more staff in the acute admissions unit. And we only had, unfortunately, 12 standalone CPAP devices in our whole hospital trust. And so we couldn't purchase any, there were none to purchase. And so I'll tell you a little story of what we uh, did in-house. So this was the initial algorithm depending on how the patients presented, how they responded to oxygen. They went into red, amber, and yellow pathways. And unless they needed urgent intubation, they got trials of CPAP. And depending on the response, they might go to high-frequency nasal oxygen, high-flow nasal oxygen, stay on CPAP, or maybe get intubated. Uh, we've now refined this, and this is a, a simplified form, and you can get it uh, from the Apple Store, there's a UCL app and, uh, on managing COVID, and this is our pathway. So on the 16th of March, the UK guidelines were not to use CPAP, but ourselves and other hospitals started using it, and especially in the London area. So there was this big push and national guidelines actually got changed within 10 days. So that was on the 26th of March and the, the national intensive care bodies also induced this, um, endorsed this view that CPAP may be a benefit to patients early on and may prevent deterioration of some patients to avoid them needing invasive ventilation. And that was on the 28th of March. As I mentioned before, um, we didn't have enough machines to deliver CPAP to lots of people, and so we needed something quickly. So together with our engineers, we discussed the need for a CPAP device that could be quickly made. And i am uh, got a few gray hairs, and I remember there was this old device, which was a Wolf's high-flow CPAP device, purely mechanical, didn't have any electrical parts. And I said, well, could we do something like this? And the engineer said, yeah, easy. We can reverse engineer this. And our first discussions were on the 17th of March. And one of our engineers has very strong connections with the Formula One car racing uh, industry. And the uh, picture below shows a factory in the middle of the UK, in Northamptonshire, where they make the engines for the Mercedes Formula One cars. And he contacted the boss who immediately came on board. He sent some of his top engineers to University College London, and he turned his whole factory over to making 
reverse engineering this original whisper flow device. And I'll show you, there's a little short video and they did lots of um, CT scans and of the inner, you know, worked out the flows through the device. They did um, materials analysis and then they built in record time. So Dr. Brearley and myself, three days after they came on board, we actually tried out the first prototype on ourselves. So this was a perfect working model, which they made in three days and it worked. We're still alive and to tell the tale. Um, it got approval from the regulatory body in the UK on the 27th of March, and then we announced it to the world. And in fact, it was the headline news on the BBC on the 29th of March, and actually it, it then went global. And the, the lady who was a volunteer in the picture is one of our lovely research nurses. And while we were working on Mark I, we were also trying to improve on Mark II. And so the engineers at Mercedes and UCL improved not only the device, but the patient circuit, and that reduced the oxygen requirements by up to 70%. That got regulatory approval on the 2nd of April, and Mercedes then went about building lots of devices. And by the 15th of April, so less than a month after we had the idea, they delivered 10,000 of these devices to the Department of Health for clinical use. This is just a very quick video of a, a patient we had on the unit. It was again featured on the BBC. Uh, he was a bus driver and you can see he's there on the device. He was in our intensive care unit. And you can see, you know, he's a classic COVID patient. And, you know, he, he was not well for quite a few days. And I think if I remember rightly, he had about 10 days in total on CPAP with a combination of CPAP and high flow. At the time it was 50 hospitals, now it's 160. Um, and as I mentioned before, we kept many patients off ventilators. And that was him a few weeks later. So after four weeks, he was well enough to go home. So there's a nice happy ending there. If you want to read about this story, uh, we um, described it in this article that just came out in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Um, and, you know, there were lots of challenges and it was uh, quite a, a fun thing to do. On the right hand side of this timeline, though, you'll see we felt it was very important not just to help the UK, but the rest of the world. And so what we did was we gave the designs freely available to any legitimate company, government, charity organization to make them at an, on a no profit basis. And it was downloaded this design license nearly 1900 times. And so far it's gone to around 30 teams. And you can see it's some countries it's being made, Philippines, Pakistan, Peru, Paraguay, etc. And some charities have, uh, uh, bought them, for example, in Uganda and Palestine. And I'm pleased to say even India as well. Good for India. There's a company called Secure who are making them. They've called it the Oxy CPAP P12. So that's available in India. Has it made a difference? Well, we don't have the randomized control trial data. Our experience, um, a quarter of the patients admitted to hospital received CPAP. And of those patients, um, um, a third had CPAP as a ceiling of treatment. They weren't deemed suitable to be invasively ventilated because of frailty, underlying comorbidities. And a quarter of them actually got through and survived to leave hospital. Of the remained, remaining two thirds who were for full escalation, about 59% were eventually intubated, but the overall survival of these 79 patients was 73%, so 27% mortality rate which is actually better than, far better than the national average. And it also allowed us to help smaller hospitals around us because it allowed us to keep intensive care resources available for very sick patients. So we transferred in 52 patients from other hospitals. Can you predict who will do well or badly? Again, we just published this paper um, looking at people who at the time that CPAP was started, could we work out who was going to do well, who was going to do badly? So the blue shows patients who didn't need 
intubation. The pink boxes show those who failed, who actually needed intubation. The um, shaded areas are the normal ranges, and on the left for the PF ratio, that's mild, moderate, and severe, according to the, the Berlin criteria for ARDS. And you can see these patients, when they started on their CPAP, their PF ratio was on the borderline between moderate and severe respiratory failure. They all had high respiratory rates, over 30 median. But the things that differentiated patients who would do well on CPAP or do badly were those who were more inflamed, did badly, so a significantly higher C-reactive protein, and perhaps a marker of microvascular thrombosis within the lung, so the D-dimer levels were very high, and the strain on the heart, so the NT pro BMP levels as a marker of left ventricular strain dysfunction, again, significantly higher, as was the troponin in patients who would go on to do badly. So it seems like the inflamed, probably hypercoagulable, right heart strain patients were those who would do badly on CPAP and need ventilation. So that's a, a prognostic biomarker scheme. As I mentioned, uh, lots of other hospitals in the UK also adopted high flow nasal oxygen CPAP, and it's been actually a very good strategy. The last few slides just talking about um, outcomes. So in the UK, we have a national body that collects data from intensive care units in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And this has just uh, been accepted in press in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. And they divided 10,000 patients into pre-peak, peak, and post-peak phases. The median age was 61, 59, 59 across the three phases. The PF ratios, they were quite severe, and if anything, a bit more severe through the three phases. The need for invasive ventilation was initially very high. So at any point, 84% of patients at the beginning were intubated, but by the end of the post-peak period, this was down to 61, and it's now well below 40%. Renal replacement therapy. There was ne less need for ventilation, less need for sedation, less need for drying out these patients, and renal replacement therapy has fallen by a third. Duration of intensive care stay has been the same in non-survivors, but has fallen by a median two days in survivors and mortality has also improved by about 25%. This is in the second surge, there's now more data coming through. And again, there's an even shorter stay for survival. As I mentioned, the need for advanced respiratory support is below 40%, whereas over the whole of the first surge, it was 70%. Cardiovascular and renal support has also fallen significantly. And the same in France. This is actually from France, Belgium, Switzerland. Over the course of the uh, first uh, surge in France, Belgium, Switzerland, high flow oxygen increased, non-invasive ventilation increased, the need for intubation, invasive ventilation fell, as did 90-day mortality rates. So we learned that the risk to healthcare workers from using CPAP, high flow nasal oxygen from these so-called aerosolization generate, generating procedures was very low. And yes, please do wear PPE. Keeping patients off uh, ventilators seemed to be a good idea unless necessary. And you know we can clearly talk about when is necessary. And the outcome data that I've presented does seem to support this. But clearly, we wouldn't recommend excessively delaying intubation in patients who are failing non-invasive support, clearly, if they are appropriate to be intubated. I will finish there. Hopefully, the virus is sitting and will uh, disappear from view in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Singer, for an excellent presentation and showing the utility of innovation and at the same time of uh, uh, the use of oxygen, especially non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula in terms of decreasing the mortality. And this is something that we've learned over the last few months. 
I think this has been a global experience and even if you look at the data from our uh, country, it would also suggest the same thing that we have moved more and more towards non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula uh, rather than towards invasive ventilation. And also innovation has been something that has really come up in a big way uh, across the world, whether it be making PPEs, N95 masks or ventilators, both invasive and for non-invasive ventilation. Many industries even in our country would, that were not involved in making medical equipment came forward. And now it seems that we actually have a surplus of uh, both invasive and non-invasive ventilators because there are so many industries which uh, for various reasons, I think it's partly also related to the fact that a lot of uh, non-medical industries came to a little bit of a halt during the time of the lockdown and they were able to therefore sort of focus on what was really needed in terms of ventilatory support, PPEs, N95 masks. A lot of our garment industry moved into making PPEs. A lot of our uh, electronic uh, industry moved into making ventilators. And we had this huge uh, uh, number of these devices available. We were very worried at one point in time, especially when we heard stories from Italy and Spain of uh, ventilators being shared and strategies of two patients or three patients being put on one ventilator. And that was something which was frightening, but luckily we didn't really have to go through that. We have a number of questions and uh, I'll start with the question which is to Dr. David Braley because it's related to the case that he had presented. And that was that in your patient that you presented, did we give steroids? He was an obese patient. And if, you, if that was not done at that point in time, would you have given it today? Good question. Um, this was before the recovery trial results. So in essence, no. You know, like, I think like everybody, we were querying the utility of steroids. I mean, we're intensive care doctors. We love a bit of steroid. Um, but we, we, we were really unclear that the advice was don't give and so on and so forth. So we didn't in this chat. Now, if he came to see us again today, we probably would. No, we would give him steroids. Um, and, and then we would have to look uh, and obviously deal with the hypoglycemia as, as, as it occurred with insulin. Generally, generally, we haven't found giving steroids being a huge difficulty in terms of insulin resistance. Um, I think uh, in my recall, I may, may have other cases, we've only had to stop them once, and that was just because of a, a steroid-induced psychosis. Um, but um, no, if he came to see us again, well, we'll do the same again, and we'll give him some dexamethasone. Yes, I think so. We've learned over a period of time, and now we're probably more comfortable and more confident about giving steroids than we were, say, in March, because yeah. at that point in time, we were more worried about the data that had come in during the H1N1 pandemic of higher mortality with steroids. And I think it's important to understand that the timing of steroids, like I said, is very important because in the early stage, if you give steroids too early, as was also shown in the recovery trial, it may not be of benefit. It may be harmful because then you have more of viremia happening. There is more of viral replication. But once you move into a stage where the viral replication has come down and there's more of inflammation happening, there's inflammatory response, Steroids may actually make a role, and that's why in that point in time when you have need for oxygen and the patient is deteriorating, that they've really had a mortality benefit. Now, there's another I question think, which I'm going to... Yeah, please go ahead. Now, I, I, I'm going to completely agree with you there, because if we look at, again at the remdesivir, it's not particularly helpful, is it, in those later patients, those, those patients on the intensive care units, um, but the steroids, it's again, not particularly helpful, probably harmful earlier on, but much more helpful later on in the sicker patients. So I think you're absolutely right. Once the viral replication uh, decreases and the virus itself becomes less of a problem, but the inflammation's the issue, that's where the steroids uh, re really start to help. So uh, yeah, completely agree with your pricing. So the next question is actually that I'm going to ask uh, uh, both uh, the team from UK and from India, and this is basically a question which has come in. What do you what do you think is the status of remdesivir now in the treatment of COVID-19 after the solidarity trial and the WHO recommendations? Would you still give it or not give it? I'll start with Dr. Navit Vig on my left, and then I'll ask uh, Professor Singer from the UK. So Dr. Vig, your, your answer first. So 
so many trials have been done some says give some says don't give but basic thing is we have to understand the virus its pathogenesis and then the drug which we are giving and at what stage we are giving so remdesivir is what is remdesivir it is antiviral drug so it is to be given at antiviral stage for how long antiviral stage will persist for mild cases and for moderate cases antiviral stage remains for first 8 days or maximum 10 days for severe patients those whose respiratory rate is more than 30 it may persist up to 15 to 20 days so remdesivir has a role if given in patients whose respiratory rate has increased and who is about to require oxygen therapy that is the respiratory rate increasing patient not feeling comfortable and um, uh, and saturation drop of saturation to around 94 or some drop of saturation is in patient is happening that is the stage when you give uh, like that is the stage we have to give remdesivir so we have to be very clear when we are giving in late stage there is no role but in early stage on case to case basis there is a role of of remdesivir in patients who are requiring oxygen i would say little before that but you have to identify that patient so that is why the management of patient is very crucial in being in contact with patient is very crucial and monitoring the monitoring of patient whether at home or in hospital is very crucial and it's a limited group of patient where remdesivir is required thank you professor singer your comments i i would agree with professor wig it's a case of uh, if i was a patient what would i want and uh, certainly if early on i would want remdesivir um i think it's important to look at the data, the evidence and the nice presentation earlier i think sort of highlighted i think there are there are challenges and i think i've got personally a challenge with these platform trials because they're very vague in terms of the detail as to how patients were randomized and the the matching um and so for example remdesivir all of the so called gold standard prospective uh, randomized trials with a placebo arm have shown a benefit in terms of you know time in hospital need for intensive care reduced on remdesivir the platform trials done by the who solidarity didn't show it the opposite way around with steroids so recovery showed this huge effect and none of the other prospective randomized trials showed anywhere near as big an effect there was an effect but it wasn't a 30% reduction so you know and we're having the same issues now in the uk um tocilizumab again as was shown earlier in the presentation um five randomized control trials haven't shown any overall benefit given to all patients uh, a platform trial uh, has recently reported though we've not seen any data that it was much much better than steroids so i do have a bit of concern about how the randomization process is conducted so even though solidarity um, says no uh, you know i think our view certainly in our hospital at least is to carry on giving remdesivir in the pre icu state as uh, you and uh, dr brearley were talking about earlier so i totally agree with that i think we need to look at it from a pragmatic point of view and also from the point of view of as clinicians when we are managing patients how do we see things and i think very often we do see that when it's given appropriately antivirals remdesivir do have a role and therefore we can't really just uh, sort of wash it away and say that it's really not required so uh, although we're discussing moderate uh, uh, covid there is a question which i would uh, address to again both the teams and i'll ask professor anant mohan and then uh, uh, dr david brayley and this is based on a question which a doctor has asked that he is a gastroenterologist he's middle aged he's hypertensive smoker he has to covid diagnosed on the 9th of december and now has upper respiratory tract symptoms his counts are almost normal d dimer and liver function is okay il6 is also all right he's having dry cough since today his temperature has been of low grade going up to 100 degrees fahrenheit mild tachycardia up to 96 per minute saturation after 6 minute walk test is 94% his ct score is 5 by 25 he is what should be his ideal treatment in this mild case and he says should i take ivermectin 
Should I take hydroxychloroquine? Should I take favipavir? Or should I take aspirin? What would we do? Uh, well, in this situation, I think among the treatment options that he has mentioned, again, none of them have uh, shown to be having any conclusive benefit, even in mild cases. <clears throat> and he is a kind of... Uh, He's actually not very symptomatic. He has a little bit of uh, a little bit of CT pneumonia on the CT scan, and he has just borderline saturations also. So one cannot immediately say that he's absolutely okay. But at the same, he does require close monitoring. It would be good to see what are his other inflammatory markers. I think he did say that they were also all right. Uh, among the other, fever is persisting. That needs to be seen. But we have seen many times fever persisting for even up to ten days, twelve days. Uh, a benign kind of a fever which uh, subsides without anything uh, special being given. So at this point of time, I would say that maybe he, he needs to be just kind of um, uh, being monitored carefully. The <coughs> oxygen saturation is borderline. That needs to be checked. The inflammatory marker need to be checked again because this is the, I think, ninth and today's, uh, so just about one week. We have to be careful in the second week because sometimes we do see some deterioration going on in the second week. That should be closely monitored. Therapy, pharmacotherapy among the agents which he has described right now probably is not really going to help. Thank you. Uh... Dr. David Braley, what would you do in such a situation if he, if, he had, if he was in the UK? I would do almost exactly the same. I would give him my sympathy and say, carry on. Uh, there is nothing out there that is, is going to shorten that course or make him better. I know it's very tempting, but um, as we said, they, none of those drugs have been shown to work. Uh, they're not sweets. They all come with side effects, reasonably rare, but you know, they do exist. Uh, so I think we should leave those uh, in the medicine cabinet. Uh, and I'm afraid it's, uh, you know, for most people, this is, of course, a self-limiting illness. Uh, most people never come near a hospital. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, that, that's precisely the way it's going to work out for, for this poor doctor. So it has, has, certainly has my sympathy. Um, but I really don't think we should be uh, going in there and doing anything. There's nothing to suggest we would make him better and he should just get better on his own. Yes, of course, if he's getting difficulties with his breathing uh, and you're absolutely right, you know, we're, we're in the first week, that, that continues, well, obviously off to hospital, but, but right here, right now, carry on. We're on their own. So whatever data there is in, in small studies is not enough evidence to really show, say that they improved because of the drugs that they took or they could have improved on their own. And therefore, we need more data before we can say any of the drugs that, we are, uh, that he had mentioned are useful. But having said that, I'd also like to admit that across the world, many of these drugs are being used because of the fact that there is more fear than actual look at the evidence as far as treatment is concerned. And therefore, I would really advise him to take supported treatment, monitor himself more closely, and if there is evidence that he is moving on to increasing oxygen requirement or the increase in the markers, then one will have to aggressively treat him as we would do for moderate COVID. Uh, one question that I have for Dr. Neeraj, because he had discussed and uh, mentioned the CT. This is a question which someone has raised that what is the role of the CT severity score on a CT scan in deciding uh, whether to treat this patient with steroids or with remdesivir. If your CT score is high, even if your saturation is maintained, should you consider that as a sign of moderate to severe disease and start remdesivir and steroids? So uh, this CT severity score is uh, based on visual analog. So once uh, somebody is assessing a CT score, uh, that may vary with uh, two observers. So one has to be very careful uh, to interpret the CT severity score. And isolated CT severity score may not uh, be ideal thing. Uh, the overall picture of the patient along with other lab parameters have to be taken into account. But yes, the changes in CT may portend to the future progression of disease and one has to monitor that patient more closely. So if you ask uh, just based on CT finding, I will not consider starting him as a moderate severity patient. But if the other markers and clinical pictures uh, is showing uh, towards deterioration in uh, the situation of the patient, uh, one may consider initiating a moderate uh, severity protocol. Thank you. So I would also say that we've unfortunately over the last few months, 
a lot of CT scans are being done for COVID-19. But they do not sort of decide on your treatment strategy. You still have to go by clinical parameters, looking at the saturation, looking at your patient, rather than deciding treatment based only on the scan. So based the CT score in a patient uh, who is otherwise having mild disease should not be deciding your treatment. We also know that there are a significant number of patients, almost 20 to 30 percent of patients who are mild or, asympto or have asymptomatic disease. But if a CT is done in them, you will find a few areas of ground glassing, which will resolve on its own uh, over the next few days or weeks. And therefore, really no treatment is required. Uh, so you need to treat the patient and not the CT scan. Uh, one question that I have for uh, Professor Singer, and that is based on a question that has come, that now based on the recent NEGM study, are you uh, using baricitinib and remdesivir in your patients uh, as far as uh, COVID, uh, uh, moderate COVID is concerned, or you, th you think it's too early to start using this drug and we need to have more trials? So, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I read the paper the other day. So it's a, a, a JAK inhibitor, which is an oral drug used in rheumatology. Um, and remdesivir was a standard of care and added in that there was a, an extra advantage in terms of days um, spent in hospital. Um, so it looks attractive. Um, certainly, it hasn't really been on the radar in the UK, so it came a little bit out of the blue in the New England Journal paper. Um, and so I think we're just digesting it at the moment. Um, I must admit, I, uh, one of, on my to-do list is to look at complications like any drug. As uh, Dr. Brilly was saying, they aren't sweets and every drug carries complications. But it, it was an encouraging result. Um, but, you know, um, you know, certainly from an intensive care point of view, it didn't make any difference once they were sick. So if it was going to work or going to be used, I think you need to get there before they come in my direction. That's uh, very well said that although we have this paper, we need to be really having enough data and especially the safety profile before we start uh, using it routinely in all our patients. So I think we need to be judicious as when it comes to the use of this drug. So there's a question which again I'll ask uh, Dr. Pavan from our side and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, David Braley from the UK, and this question is that this is a, what blood test would you advise uh, after the patient has recovered and you're sending him home? This question specifically says day 17. So if you have a patient with COVID-19 who's recovered and you're sending him home, do we are we advising some blood tests that he should get done? A lot of patients want to know that should I get these tests done because of this so-called fear that they have that there are patients who go home and deteriorate and may suddenly collapse and die. This is a sort of a thing which is going on in the social media, and that is why a lot of patients are concerned. So, Pavan, what would be your uh, reply to this? Um, so, uh, if we could, uh, if we look at a patient with moderate disease or severe disease, if they have clinically recovered and uh, if we have previous investigations which we had normalized, I don't think there is any specific investigation to be done, let's say, just before discharge. It uh, probably won't, uh, we, we are routinely not doing it and I, I cannot see any logic for just, uh, I mean, doing an investigation just prior to discharge other than probably uh, D-dimer, if we had an elevated, uh, very high D-dimer at baseline or at some point in time and the patient, even though without DVT, was on therapeutic anticoagulation, which is now the practice. So if we have a D-dimer of more than 500, we uh, practically uh, give therapeutic anticoagulation, even though there is no evidence of DVT. Maybe then uh, we could consider a D-dimer uh, prior to discharge because uh, then there is a recommendation or there is a practice for uh, giving like extended thromboprophylaxis for these patients. So other than that, sir, I don't think there is any um, need for any investigation just prior to discharge. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. David Braley, anything from your side? I tell you what's so interesting about all of this is the amount of similarities between us. I, I was expecting a whole load of different approaches, but actually we're incredibly similar. So, no, we wouldn't do any routine uh, blood tests. There's nothing out there that, uh, that will be helpful in any respect. 
I mean, to be fair, there's, there's, there's lots of things that, that could be interesting, and the, obviously there's lots of research in this area of follow-up CT scans, follow-up cardiac MRIs, uh, but these are very much in the research domain at the moment. Long COVID, what is long COVID, define it, uh, find out the cause, et cetera, et cetera. But no, if someone has recovered for a, for a mild, moderate, to be fair, even severe COVID like our chap, um, then no, we wouldn't routinely do a, 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 any blood tests as it doesn't guide management and it doesn't help prognosticate at the moment. So maybe that will change, but uh, right here, right now, no, I, I, I wouldn't be taking that blood. Unless we have some sort of uh, uh, long COVID or post COVID sequelae that we're concerned about and we really need to follow up that patient and that is being done more in our post COVID clinics that we run in terms of following up these patients. Uh, but majority of patients recover totally and can be sent home without really uh, worrying about too many tests. There's another question which I'll uh, probably ask uh, Professor Singer first and then maybe Dr. Wig, and that is the role of anticoagulants. Mm. In patients with moderate COVID, what uh, are we routinely giving anticoagulants for how long? And in, is it in a prophylactic dose or a therapeutic dose? And then the question goes on to say is that at the time of discharge, are you putting your patients on oral anticoagulants or DOVAX uh, routinely or in some, are you using it or not? So Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Professor Singer and then maybe Dr. Wig. No, I, I think that's a great question. Um, sadly, um, there aren't the uh, prospective randomized trials to say what we should be doing. We know, and again, it came up in the talk earlier, that there is a high incidence of both macro and micro thrombotic complications. So again, certainly the data coming from around the world in terms of patients who are sick enough to need intensive care, up to 30% of patients have proven uh, pulmonary emboli, venous thromboembolism, deep vein thrombosis, or, and we've seen a few arterial um, emboli as well. So clearly this is a major problem and clearly there's a, a strong relationship with in these patients having pulmonary hypertension and that might be a, a significant problem downstream. I think what we're doing at present is that, you know, clearly if there's any clinical indication or ideally in any intensive care patient, provided they're fit enough to travel, um, we take them to a CT scan but clearly that only looks at the larger pulmonary emboli rather than microemboli. Um, what generally has been a shift, not evidence-based, but I think because of the recognition at autopsy and so forth that there's a lot of microthrombi, especially in patients with D-dimers being very high, et cetera, or right heart strain on echocardiography, we're going for at least... Um, double dose prophylactics. So instead of a single dose in oxyparin, we're going to a BD dose, for example. So what tends to happen in our hospital, but many other hospitals, is that you get full anticoagulation. If you've got a proven pulmonary embolus DVT, you get double dose prophylactic for everybody else. And clearly the gray area, if you haven't got a proven large PE, but you have... Um, a very, very high D-dimer, should these people get full anticoagulation or not? There's a degree of uncertainty. Continuing, once they're awake, fit, mobile, unless they've got a proven DVT or PE, we tend to stop it, at least in our hospital. Again, I, I know certainly where now there's so-called long COVID clinics that quite a number of people are presenting with uh, quite severe pulmonary hypertension. So whether or not anticoagulation, no acts, whatever, in the longer term make any difference, again, we, we lack the trial data. Yeah, so what do we do? So we have a, we have a moderate patient whose respiratory rate is more than 24 and saturation is around 94%. So that means he has already gone into inflammatory phase. So we have to see that the patient has moved from viral phase to mnemonic to inflammatory stage. Now this in inflammation, there is a lot of 
हाइपर कॉगुलेशन गोइंग ऑन इन साइड द बॉडी एंडोथिलियर डिसफंक्शन इज हैपनिंग सो वट वी हैव सजेस्टेड इज एंड फ्रॉम दिस इज फ्रॉम फर्स्ट ऑफ अप्रैल आई एम टेलिंग यू फ्रॉम फर्स्ट ऑफ अप्रैल वी हैव डन टू थिंग्स वी हैव गिवन फॉर मॉडरेट पेशेंट स्टेरॉयड्स एंड सेकेंड थिंग वट वी हैव डन इज वी हैव गिवन दैम एंटी कॉगुलेशन लो मलिकल वेट हैपनिन in prophylactic doses 40 units of enoxaparin so what this has done is this helps them tide over the crisis and after they are discharged we don't put them on any anticoagulation or any of the drugs so this is just to tide over that crisis in moderate patients which moderate definition in us and uk is uh, is critical illness but ours is that moderate illness and what we have done in in our autopsy studies minimally invasive tissue sampling in 37 of patients of our patients who were on anticoagulation we could find microthrombi only in two patients rest of patients there were no microemboli it was pure diffuse alveolar pneumonia or in the early phase with hyaline membrane or it was in the later phase it was fibrosis after 6 or 7 days so there is so i think it is preventive we know the cytokine storm is there we know the hyperinflammation is there in that phase we know that endothel endothelial dysfunction is there so prophylactic anticoagulation has been very effective and in our autopsy series we have also seen that there are only microthrombi in two patients rest were clean lungs absolutely clean lungs with no thrombi thank you so i agree with that and what normally one would do is now because of the data which has emerged one would definitely in moderate cases give prophylaxis with low molecular heparin in many centers uh, although the guidelines don't mention it one would give a therapeutic dose if the patient comes into the icu and has deteriorated and gone into severe or critical illness so prophylaxis to begin with and therapeutic dose later on if need be the guidelines uh, at some of the guidelines mention that you can give one and a half of the therapy of the prophylactic dose rather than giving a full therapeutic dose also accepting the fact that data shows that despite aggressive anticoagulation there will be a small percentage of patients who will continue to have both arterial and venous uh, thrombus formation uh, we are running out of time we are actually exceeded our time so i'll just take two quick questions one to dr anant mohan uh what uh, the question says methyl prednisolone versus dexamethasone is one superior to the other and why are we not promoting more of dexa because of it has anti inflammatory effect and is long acting in our guidelines we actually have mentioned both can be given so the question is wh what should we do uh, and maybe i can ask uh, uh, dr uh, professor singer what he what they are do, uh, using as far as uk is concerned dr anand mohan yeah so so like uh, like he said in our in the national guidelines both are mentioned that that the reason is because we really don't know which is superior to the other as of now conclusively and the dose approximate the relative dosage has also been adjusted keeping in view the potency the relative potency of one over the other here the tendency in our again this again varies from center to center in our center in the critical care and even in the other <laughs> moderate patients tendency is to use more of the um, Uh, the methylprednisolone in our setup, but uh, we have used dexamethasone as well, IV as well as oral, and more often than not, we tend to stop at around uh, seven to ten days in the few patients in whom it is required. Then we give the kind of a tapering dose over a period of time. I am not aware of any head-to-head -head studies as of now which is published which has compared the two steroids uh, from uh, one one over the other. So I would say probably they are at par, but I'll ask opinion of others. Professor Singer, any uh, comments from your side? I ag completely agree. Yeah, I, I think in terms of effect, they're fairly equivalent. I think the the more perhaps interesting question is the dose. You know, because um, again, certainly before recovery came out, and even in our own practice, that you know we we were using some hydrocortisone, dexamethasone, methylpred. You know, they, it was fairly empiric, but sometimes the methylpred dose varied from, you know. Point one, you know, one mg per kilo, point five, one mg per kilo, up to you know a gram of methylpred, you know. So you know the really big immunosuppressive doses, and it might be, you know, I'm, I'm speculating, but patients who are very, very hyperinflamed, for example, those with CRP values, you know, we were seeing four, five hundred, you know, very high D-dimers. These patients. Potentially may respond to a, an even bigger dose of steroids. So clearly, that speculation. We need 
ideally prospective randomized trials. So I think nobody would want to stop giving steroids, but I think the interesting question is what dose? And can we pick uh, as far as I remember, there is a meta-analysis which, which has looked at uh, various studies as far as steroids are concerned, and it looked at methylprednisolone, uh, dexamethasone, and hydrocortisone, and showed benefit from all of them, although the number of studies was very limited in that meta-analysis, which looked at the role of steroids as far as COVID-19 is concerned. The challenge, of course, is the dose of steroids, especially when you're going on to a cytokine storm or the person is deteriorating. And I'm aware that very many centers actually will give a pulse methylprednisolone, a very high dose methylprednisolone, if the patient has deteriorated or gone into frank cytokine storm with very high levels, but the really evidence is not that strong or evidence is not really there. Uh, there are some, pati some patients who at a time when anti-IL-6 drugs were not freely available, tocizolimab was not freely available, when these patients showed frank features of cytokine storm, a total whiteout lung, very high levels of IL-6 and CRP, uh, and uh, they, they were given high-dose methylprednisolone, but I'm not really sure whether we have enough data to say that that high dose is superior to giving a lower moderate dose that we are routinely giving. So I think we need more data, but steroids definitely have a role. We just need to have more evidence as in terms of the dose, the ideal dose in moderate and severe patients as far as COVID-19 is concerned. We run out of time, and therefore, I'd just like to now ask all the panelists to give a take-home message so that the audience can have some sort of a message. And I'll start with uh, Professor Singer, if he would just give a brief take-home message for all the audience who are there on this uh, grand round. Uh, no, thank you. It's been a, a, a real pleasure um, uh, chatting with you and as Dr. Brilly said earlier, it's lovely to hear how uh, common our approach is. And I think that emphasizes, I think it's common sense, pragmatism. You, you know, don't play with drugs unless they're within the remit of a trial. I, I think, you know, let's stick to what we know, which seems to be effective and then let's prove uh, what other therapies might be effective with proper trials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. David Brealy, any uh, take-home message from your side? Yeah, and I, I think I'm just going to build on what just Mervyn said. Well, A, a thank you so much for, for, for this morning, or well, this morning here. Uh, it's, it's been fascinating. I think, you know, just to build on what Mervyn says, we can't shortcut the science here. Uh, we have to understand what we're dealing with first, find the appropriate targets, and then develop the... Uh, the drugs against those targets and then do the trials. Just opening up a medicines cabinet and throwing medication around, it's not helpful, it doesn't work, and probably, it probably ends up being harmful. So I know it's very frustrating to have to wait and to have patience, but we must. We must carry on the science and uh, we'll get there. So I think that's all I'm going to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pavan Tiwari. Pavan, you wanted to do some take home message? it is very important to look at our patient and uh, from the subgroup of patients we should uh, just be able to uh, based on clinical evaluation be able to decide which are the patients who are at risk of severe disease and those who have telltale signs or uh, signs that uh, indicate critical illness and then the most important thing is to initiate treatment at the earliest and uh, we should stick to these time uh, tests so far for time tested treatment that is um, uh, oxygen therapy, awake proning, steroids, and remdesivir. Basically, th those are uh, the mainstays of treatment as of now. Thank you very much, Dr. Neeraj. Any uh, monitoring of the patient that will decide uh, the outcome of the patient. So we have seen that moderate group of patients are the best suited for any intervention, and we should identify these patients, initiate appropriate available treatment and uh, we can save life amongst them. Thank you very much, Dr. Navid Twig. Yeah, so v what we should do is we should not, we should, mild patients should remain mild and moderate patients should remain moderate. Mild should not become moderate and moderate should not become severe. 
For becoming mild to moderate, we have some now inflammatory markers. We know the timing of the disease. We know inflammatory markers are easily available, which we should pick up early. And then if we are picking them in inflammatory stage, then with small dose of steroids, we can, we can ensure that they don't become severe. So again, day of illness is most important in COVID. This is what I have learned. And then I have to ensure that they will not go into moderate phase by picking them inflammation early by doing their CRP. If CRP is getting higher, then 6 milligram of dexamethasone or equivalent dose of methylpadnisolone is very effective in ensuring that they don't become uh, severe. Thank you. Dr. Anand Mohan. So, uh, so I think um, most important the messages have been given actually, but uh, again uh, reinforcing the fact that one uh, we should not rely only on one <coughs> test or a one parameter to make major therapeutic decisions. That is one. So we treat the patient as a whole, look at the clinical profile and the trend of the blood test. Probably just relying only on a single single blood test and the clinical picture not being co uh, you know concordant with that probably may be wrong. A, a concordant picture of clinical profile, a trend in the inflammatory markers or other markers should make us aware and alert us to, you know, stepping up or stepping down the therapy. Thank you very much. Before I conclude, uh, I would really request uh, Professor Monica Lakhanpal, if she is there uh, with us, uh, if she would, if she has any comments to give uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much for inviting me to give some closing remarks. Just to say that thank you to everybody who's given up their time for this webinar today. Um, it's been fascinating hearing all the case studies and even being a pediatrician, I've learned a huge amount because it was expressed in such a clear, clear and simple way really to understand the common challenges and differences as well. I look forward to many more of these seminars. I think there's a lot for us to learn together. And in a way, COVID has opened up the opportunity for more online meetings and given us some opportunities we actually probably didn't have before. So some positive things to look forward to as well as some of the challenges that we have. So thank you again, Professor Galeria and all your colleagues at Ames. Thank you very much. So uh, I have two broad messages. One, of course, regarding the topic itself. And I'd like to say that uh, there has been a lot of learning as far as COVID is concerned. And if you look back to February and March of uh, this year and how we were treating COVID-19 and what we are doing really now, I think there's a sea of change. Uh, but along with that, there's also been a lot of innovations. One that was shown by the University College of London in terms of a CPAP device to a lot of other things which have gone on in, through, uh, all over the world. And patient care has improved. We have enough evidence to show that the mortality has now come down with proper treatment strategies of timing drugs at a proper point in time. Uh, there have been a lot of questions which we were not able to take up because of lack of time, predictors for how which patient will deteriorate, role of early remdesivir in patients who are having mild or asymptomatic disease, the pathophysiology of happy hypoxemia, what is silly or what is, how do we treat that, and of course the role of vaccine. So we'll try and answer those questions through messages rather than being able to take it because we really have really have run out of time. But I'd also like to say that this is another good sign of the collaboration that we have between the two institutes, the All Institute of Medical Sciences and U University College London. And I think using the web-based system and using the IT platforms, we can further our collaboration both in, term, in learning, in teaching, and in research. And we should look at this as an opportunity to really move ahead in terms of strengthening our collaboration in all areas so that we can have a very good partnership, which is beneficial not only to the two institutes, but really for patient care and cutting edge research. So thank you very much to all of you. And I'm really grateful to everyone, those who are there on the screen, but even those who are behind the screen and have done all the work in getting this uh, going, especially uh, Amit Khandelwal, who's really worked hard. Thank you all for this uh, uh, webinar and uh, I would just like to say that we look forward to the next National Combined Grand Round and hopefully another Grand Round with University College of London. Thank you all. Thank you very much.